no, <laughs> lay it on me. Okay. This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Mishway Barber on October. Barber Way. I did it the wrong way. Wait, what? Barber Way. Not Way Barber. Way was my original last name, and my husband really wanted me to take his last name, but I also didn't want to not end in Way. Okay. So now my full name is Barber Way. Doesn't that sound better too than Way Barber? Yeah, I think that's what. Barbara Did I just way. type it the wrong way? Or yeah, yeah, maybe. Or it, people have gotten it confused in articles before too because the, the natural thing would be the new name goes on the end. Yeah. I did it the backwards way. Okay, because I think some articles have it the backwards Yeah, they have it wrong, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, eh. Well, we're going to leave that in there. Because mm -hmm. that's, that's actually kind of funny. I've messed up everyone's names that I've interviewed. Like, Good. I don't know what's going on. It's just your thing. <laughs> okay. That's your cool thing. <laughs> yeah. <that's neat. laughs> um, okay. This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Mish Barber Way. There we go. On October 10th, 2016 in... Arcadia, California. Arcadia, California for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. And I told you this is a, this is like a, this is your life interview. It's a personal and professional history. Uh -huh. um, so I'd like to start at the very beginning. If you could talk a bit about your childhood family of origin and growing up in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I am the oldest of four. Um, I have a brother who is a year and however close, like my mom pregnant, spit me out or pushed me out and then pregnant with my brother right away after kind of thing. Um, my brother and then I have two younger sisters. My youngest sister and I are eight years apart. Um, and I come from a very loud, big, family that likes to have fun and likes to socialize and drink and be super open and everything is crazy all the time and because my, my both my dad and my mom came from my mother's Polish and my dad's as Canadian as he could be um, and they both have uh, five brothers and sisters and so there's always big family um, so I grew up in North Vancouver I went I was when I was a kid I was always pretty um, I was really into, I, well, I was always into music and, and being theatrical, but I found my way through figure skating. So, and I don't, and dance, and I don't know why. I asked my mother if she pushed me into figure skating. She's like, no, that was just something you wanted to do on your own when you were five. So I was a competitive figure skater and dancer until I was 16. And then, you know, when you're 14, 15, 16 is when you start to try all the fun things like oh, I'm doing mushrooms or smoking a little weird. And then, and I also knew I was never gonna be an Olympic champion. I, I figure skated very, very seriously all throughout my youth. And then in my teenage years, there's this thing that happens to female figure skaters where when you go through puberty, um, you get an ass and you get tits usually, and it throws off all your momentum. So when I was quitting, I was learning my triples, but I was going through puberty and you lose your jumps because your body's your instrument and suddenly your body has all this extra female weight on it that you don't know what to do with. So you have to relearn everything and that's at a lot of point where um, uh, a lot of girls will quit. And I was no different. I also, as I said, I was never gonna be an Olympic champion. Um, but I knew that I wanted to learn how to play guitar. So I started playing guitar and I had, um, found all the people in my school that would want to play rock music and we would do that and and yeah and then I went to university and um my parents were really adamant on me finishing my education so it didn't matter how or what as long as I did it can I ask a couple questions go ahead before we get there okay um, were your parents supportive, like, once you quit figure skating and wanted to play guitar? Were they supportive of your interest in music or your uh, creative? Um, my mother really wanted me to uh, finish certain things in figure skating, like get certain accolades um, to say that you had finished. And, and I did that. I did that to, I would always do anything to make my mom happy because, and at that time, I was a really, I was a bad teen. I was not a great teen. Mm -hmm. I was really shitty and broke a lot of rules, but my one fallback was I always got good grades, so my parents could really kind of had to give me that one. And my dad was just constantly irritated with me. We're very close now, but I was, I was the worst. I would have been irritated too. Like, I don't blame him at all. So, you know, he wasn't really, I don't think he, he wasn't as invested in the dance and figure skating as my mother was. Like, that was something that she was such a big part of that, of that part of my life. 
So for her, it meant a lot that I complete these certain tests and accolades and thing. And I did, I did that, you know, that was um, important for her. And what kind of trouble <laughs> were you getting into in high school? I was just, I was bad. I just always wanted to, you know, would try anything, didn't want to come home, didn't want to, you know, wanted to be out with my friends all the time, wanted to go to shows, wanted to do this, wanted to do that, you know. Got in tons of driving accidents, just, just stupid stuff. Um, and what kind of music did you get into? Because you said you started playing guitar. Yeah. Met kids. At yeah. School, so, so my friend, I met this girl named Sophie, Sophia Zambo, who she was always in my grade and she was like the only cool punk girl. And we were never close and then we became friends in the 11th grade. And she started, she had a band, she had this whole life that was outside of high school. And I was just like, oh my God, she started taking me to shows. And that's what really turned me around was her. You know, she showed me, um, she would make me tapes. We, we, I'd go, I think we, it all started because we had to do a project together, like a school project. And we just ended up listening to music the whole time and hanging out. And, and slowly she kind of put me here. Oh, because you know with music, it's that thing, right? Like you don't realize this huge onion that you could unpeel and all these possibilities and, and how much you love it. And to, but someone's got to show you. Yeah. They have to give you the gateway drug to get to the really good stuff, you know? And that's kind of what she did. Um, but yeah. And so, and so going to shows and having this friend who brought you there, that gave you some kind of direction so you weren't just yeah. getting into trouble and... Well, and it was also, yeah, like that became a new thing and it was also, um, it gave me something to aspire to and get excited about and, and I was, I got, when I started playing guitar I got really, really into it and I would sit in, I remember like sitting in my room, I had this a mirror as part of my bedroom set and I would sit on the floor and play and watch myself and try and like and then you know like not let my eyes go out of my eyes and I would just have to do you know I was like got really technical and I used to be so much I learned on an acoustic too which is the best way to learn because it makes your fingers stronger um, so I was really obsessive with that for a long time which was good that's good. You're self-taught or did you take I had some lessons from this guy named Ed. I'll never forget him. Ed. He was this tall, lanky guy. Was he like one of those 80s rock, rock guys? He, no, he was, was more like aspiring. His band kind of sounded more like an aspiring Nickelback-y kind of vibe. Oh. Well, I remember when I looked it up yeah. years later. But he was really nice. And he was all very like technically trained and classically trained. But I don't know why he thought he wanted to play that kind of music. <laughs> But um, but he was really nice. He um, was cool. Did you always write lyrics to like? Were you writing your own songs? Yeah, then? Because yeah. Because you're a writer. Uh, yeah. By trade as well. Yes. Um, and you said you're really into theater. Were you so you were also writing lyrics? Yeah. Writing has always been a big part of my life since I was a child. I my mother has like duotangs and duotangs of um, stories I would handwrite when I was. I loved writing. Like that was just always the thing. That and coloring. Um, but with lyric, whenever I would listen to music when I was young, and I still do this, like the lyrics are the most important part to me. I want to know exactly what the person is saying, just especially if it's a really impactful song. And and I would just, you know, whenever I buy a CD or a tape or whatever, would be reading, like dying to know exactly what they talked about or what they were saying, and um, paid a lot of attention to lyrics. Mm -hmm. So the lyrics are poetry that's you know got the, the cheesy element taken away because it's got a soundtrack yeah. it's the same thing it's hard to do well mm -hmm. it's easy to do horribly and who are some of your influences back then well I grew up okay well I'll talk about my influences from my family first and then my personal thing so my dad is a big Van Morrison fan everything is Van Morrison and so by falter whether I realize it or not I'm like I love him even as cheesy 80s stuff when it gets brutal like I still love it because it's home to me you know like I hear a them song I know every word it reminds me of being with my dad and my uncles on our farm like you know listening it's just like this comforting and I love him um, and then I also grew up my grandfather was really into um, female jazz vocalists and blues 
and I would spend a lot of time with him. He'd make a lot of cassette tapes and we would go to jazz and blues concerts together before he died and, and listen to a lot of vinyl together and listen to, he was, him and I had a mu connection over music. And so that stuff is always very inspiring to me. Dinah Washington is hands down one of my, I can listen to her records forever. And I think she's a very punk in a, in a way. Um, but then when I was a teen, you know, I got like, I did the learning in reverse because when I was getting, when I was a teen, it was early 2000s. And so it was a really bad period for music. If you do not re recall, you do <laughs> recall, don't you? It wasn't the best. Mm -hmm. um, I've said this before in articles, but like, thank God for like Brody and stuff like that. Uh, so I learned in reverse and I got really into the 90s shit because that was kind of the, the, you know, the 2000s was a response to that, you know, Britney was a response to all these wild women on stage, like it just became more polished and contained and that was all really boring and even the rock music that was out was really boring. I can't, I was never dying over the pop punky, it's never been my bag. Um, I can appreciate it, but it's not my thing and so I got really into like, Babes in Toyland, L7, whole, that whole genre. Because obviously when you're 16 and you're trying to figure out what the hell you're doing and how to be a woman and you hear these people screaming about those exact things with so much force and vulnerability and and weirdly confidence at the same time, you can't help but be attracted to that. Like I get the same joy listening to Danzig or The Replacements or whatever, but there's a different nostalgia and joy I feel listening to Cat Balin or Courtney Love or, or you know, like Jen, Jennifer Finch even in a funny L L7 interview or something like that. So I got in the Breeders too, I love the Breeders, but I got into all that, that whole category. Um, because uh, when you're a teen, you need, you need the identity politics when you're a teenager. Yeah. Because you're so, um, you're developing. I feel like your, your, your tastes and your brain and your understanding of the world and everything is developing and you cling to that stuff as like this comfort. Can I ask how you, because I told you you're, I think you're the youngest person I've interviewed so far. So the questions are like a little bit different. Yeah. This was early 2000s, you're a teenager. Yeah. I was a teenager in the mid 90s. So yeah. those were all of my, yeah, yeah. you know, playing guitar. I'm like, oh, here are all these women that I can yeah. identify with and kind of like copy and emulate. Yeah. It speaks to me. How did you find all of them? Internet? No, I did the smart thing of when I started playing music, um, with, which is what I tell everyone who asks, how, like young girls are like, what do I do? Play with people older and better than you. Okay. Their skill level's better. It'll force your skill level to up. And that's what I did. And so a lot of my friends had gone through that. Like my be best friend who's our drummer, she's, five years older than me. So, you know what I mean? Yeah. So a lot of my friends um, ended up being older once I shifted from um, into that whole yeah. way. Um, and but it's yeah. funny because we were talking about it on the way here, but you said early 2000s, you had like the distil the distillers. Um, and I was, <laughs> I was saying that I feel, I know a lot of people who are like five to 10 years younger than me and Brody is like their Courtney Love. Like yeah, yeah, their, yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that they, that's their, their older one that they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and like I miss that. Got me yeah. Now I know who she is. Yeah. It's funny how that all works because I feel like there's just, that's that's how the, the, the timeline and the legacy lives on. It's just tweaked a bit for the next one. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be cool to trace it all the way. I mean, it traces all the way back to who would it trace all the way back to? I'm it's trying far. to think. It's still, but it would go forever. It goes until, you know, I don't know, whatever. Like just rock women in general? Yeah. Yeah, I always, I always just say Sister Rosetta Tharpe because I don't really know anything before her. <laughs> okay, well that's true. <laughs> yeah, like, eh. I, I got this great album not long. I had to go to Amoeba and do the like, in my bag thing. And I found this record that was, um, it's called The Kitchen Tapes. And it's all these ladies singing about, in the 20s, like all these old blues yeah. ladies that no one knows about. They're just shitty recordings in there. Yeah. Singing about having to work in the kitchen and working gear and doing this. And it's a fucking awesome record. It's really haunting and cool yeah. and pretty. But maybe it goes back to them. I'm obsessed with that stuff. So you have yeah, to you I'll, I'll, sh I'll okay. show you. It's like right over there. Um, oh, and also, who were some writers who influenced you when you were 
younger. Oh, I gotta think of when I was younger, who was I reading? Or if that wasn't really a big kind of part of your life. No, yet. I'm trying to think. With reading, I have always been, with books and stuff, mm -hmm. I've always been someone that pref I prefer nonfiction. So for me, you know, reading stuff that I would have read in school or, or, you know, reading one article in time and then looking up that, oh, that writer wrote for this and then finding all their other stuff. Like I've always kind of just done that and, and read um, nonfiction stuff. I had a f I mean, I'm trying to think of what I was reading back then that I got so obsessed with. There must have been many things. Oh, here's a good one. Okay, so when I was, this is later in my life, probably like my mid, not mid-20s, early 20s. And she's, I actually ended up working for her, but Tracy, who, uh, Tracy Egan Morgan, who's originally started Broadly, she used to have this blog called One D at a Time. Mm -hmm. And she re wrote under this alias called Slut Machine. And she wrote, <laughs> and this was like before, this is when people were still using LiveJournal and things like that, I believe. It wasn't a big thing. And I think it was just a blog spot. And I remember finding her, that, um, that blog, through a friend of mine who showed it to me and I was just obsessed with it. So this was really funny. She just wrote about her, you know, sex and her life and it was super refreshing and weird and she it was kind of the, the the confessional thing that's so ever so popular now and is driving the literary market but she was kind of doing it to begin with and then she ended up being the one that started broadly um vice's female site mm -hmm. that i worked for for a while and so i you know she called me up and like offered me a job and for me as when i used to read that and i was like oh. <laughs> my giddy little full circle but i was really into that that was and i'm trying to think of like I was when the internet was first. We were all like getting computers and, or you were getting like laptops and stuff in school. I'm trying to think. It's so hard to dig back that far. Yeah. Well, maybe things will come up like Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Something come will come up again. Um, okay, but you said so you graduated high school and your family expected you to, to go continue. to college or go to yeah. university? So I got um, accepted to a few universities, but one was on the island. Uh, of Vancouver, Victoria, um, the University of Victoria, and I got into this creative writing program there, so I went. And I did not want to move there. It's just kind of like a, um, a step down from Vancouver uh, in the smaller city, um, but I wanted to, you know, like, get, I moved out when I was really young, so I just was, this is a place I can go, I can do this. Um, I, so I did the creative writing program, I was quickly, um, I shunned myself out of it. I had a couple really, uh, prof professors that were really, um, pushed me away from wanting to do writing in that way. And then I took a few philosophy courses and this course in feminist philosophy. And of course, again, coming back to identity politics, when you're young and you're moldable and you're, wow, this is like, this makes sense to me. Of course it does dummy, you're a woman. This is the sort of talking about you. So that's what I, I ended up switching over with to study. And I don't regret it at all, but I did, I mean, I wish I had pursued criminology instead. And oh. that's something that I was always really fascinated with and criminology, sociology, psychology. I wish that I'd pursued that vein and be become something in that. That's my... You know when you do the looking back, what the the other ways I could have gone. Yeah. I used my education. I mean, I worked. Um, I, you know, been writing about women and sex forever. I play in this band. Uh, you know, I use it. But I do wish that I'd pursued that um, vein. You still could. I'm gonna go back and do eight years of schooling now. You could. We'll talk about that. Yeah, after that's <laughs> that. I mean, there's other things I would like to do, but yeah, that's yeah. the other scary thing that where you feel like you have that one chance. Mm -hmm. So I did that school. Um, I'm, I was in Victoria. I was in love with my first boyfriend who lived in Vancouver and was a pro skateboarder. We had a band together, and. Um, oh wait, what was your what was the band? It was it was called La Sauterelle, which is the grasshopper in French. It was named after my family farm because we couldn't think of anything. Um, so I had a little like dorky band when I was in Victoria. We never did anything. We just played. It was just you know three of my friends trying to play together. But I was really depressed in Victoria. 
Um, I also had mono for about five months and didn't know it was super Wayne's World and then figured it out. <laughs> um, but I thought I was really depressed and bummed out being there and I, I think I part of me was. Um, so I finished my year, again to please the parents, took a year off and just worked and saved money and then enrolled in a university in Vancouver, Simon Fraser University, which was less of a communal, everyone let's play froth and go to these massive school events and get involved and it was more a school where you go to school and you go home, which is what I wanted. I had my own social life. You know those, I mean, I don't know how university is very different here, but yeah, that's it's a little like a more pushy college. like that and I was like, uh, no, I just want to go and go home. Yeah. I don't want to be involved. Thank you. You know, um, were you still doing music while you were in school? Or no, I started White Lung. White Lung's my first real band. Oh, okay. So I started that when I I met Anne Marie. Well, I was playing in that band with my ex boyfriend, and I was just I was playing guitar. I wasn't singing. Um, I was just doing lead guitar, and he he was really into Joy Division esque that kind of music and so it was fun but it wasn't what I wanted to play I wanted to sing and be the lead person and so I met Anne Marie who's our drummer just at shows and stuff and her and I just decided right away we wanted to start a band together and the band was nothing forever I went and lived in the Netherlands for a year to go to school because I wanted to leave and get away from Vancouver you know, when it started, it was four girls, two of which fought with each other constantly. It was just like a joke. We weren't actually doing anything. We were just fucking around and playing shows locally. We went down to Portland, played one show with Dead Moon, you know? Like we didn't, or sorry, it was Pierce Darrow, it's not even Dead Moon. And so we didn't do anything. And then um, when I moved back from the Netherlands, we decided, Anne Marie and I kind of thought, okay, let's try and make a real record. Let's do something serious. And we kicked out uh, the, the, one of the members and so we needed a new guitar player and this young boy who we knew named Kenneth came and tried out and um, now he, he's been in our band forever he's you know we're all so close but he was kind of the person that pushed it into actually touring actually playing getting signed getting an agent getting published like, he just forced us to make a record and make better songs um. So at first, did you intend to put together like an all-female or an all... No, it was band? more just, oh, I know this person, I know this person, Anne-Marie. Oh, yeah, this girl, Natasha, who plays in this other band I'm in, she'll do it because she's got time because she barely works. You know, like it was more, I wasn't like, it has to be all women. <coughs> and I remember when we were looking for a replacement, People kept asking if it had to be a girl, and I was like, no, that's just a stupid if I deny someone a position because of their genitalia or whatever. I don't care. Yeah. Who's the best at the job? Um, so that wasn't the, the intention. I'm sure I liked that it was all girls. I'm sure that made me feel very happy, but it didn't work when it was that way. We needed the young boy energy in yeah. there to put us in our place or make us work, I guess, or have something to laugh with or at. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, so it's funny. So he, he he's like our little brother. That, like, took it. He didn't, if he didn't intentionally do it, it was just that his, his playing was so great and we just, that was kind of the click that we needed to, oh, okay, this is, he's an amazing, amazing guitar player. He's so unique and weird and excellent. And so we, he just, revitalize something that was kind of dead and stiff and not happening. Um, and you know? then when did you transition from, because you were playing guitar and singing? For yeah, the very beginning. Uh, okay. When I realized that I was not a better, uh, the, <laughs> okay, when you're doing a job and you see someone else is doing the job better than you, and you don't really need me to co-play co with you. I'm just butchering this. I should just sing and do my theatrical stuff because I'm better at that. Mm -hmm. And you do that and that, I was just trying to make sense, yeah. you know, Let, let's make sense here. I don't need to hold a guitar. I know I know how to play, you know, like yeah. Natasha was a very, that's the first girl that was in the band, was a really talented guitar player and Kenny, you know, was out of this world. And so there was no need for me to do it. Mm -hmm. And then the songwriting process changed too. Oh, when, so. Well, when Kenny joined, it was, him and I worked a lot more together and it was just because when I was me and Natasha I felt like I would kind of initiate ideas a little more and that's why the songs were not as good 
But Kenny and I are like a perfect team. Mm -hmm. Perfect team. Um, and can you just describe the the scene in Vancouver? I read that you described mm -hmm. it as small mm -hmm. but pretty welcoming. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, super welcoming. Yeah. Um, at the time that we started too, there was a lot of stuff going on for punk. And whether we considered ourselves punk or rock or whatever, we um, there was just all these under underground illegal spaces to play at. It was kind of like this weird um, utopia for that. There was the emergency room. There was the peanut gallery. There was, what was the other one? There was so many. I can't remember all the names. They're all shut down now. But that's kind of how Vancouver works because the city's really strict with um, your cabaret licenses, your actual permits. So people will open up small industrial spots and shitty places. It'll last for a couple months and the cops will come and it'll move. And then those same people will open another one two blocks down. And so when we began, the emergency room was a place that was going on, and we were part of that whole beginning. There's a, there's a, a book and a record that documents all the bands from that time. That's how we started. And it was good. I mean, it was weird because when I was started going to shows when I was younger, it was a very emo-y, not emo, but electronic emo-y mixed with this you know, the more like psych rock of Black Mountain and those bands. And then when my, the scene that I was involved in came in, it was just punk and more artsy punk and, you know, and the noise happened and it's funny how all that stuff just goes in rotation. Yeah. And how were you received by Where? audiences? Or we, people liked us. We had a, we had a good following. We, we did well. We had fun. We did well and we, you know, it was good. It was, we had a little niche, yeah. but we were always, you know, once we, the thing is you can be a band in your hometown and do that and have fun and, and have great successes. But if you want to actually do it, you have to tour and you have to get out there. Yeah. Um, Especially okay. being from Canada. Cause if you stay in Canada, you'll yeah. stay in Canada. Yeah. You're not going to go outside. Uh, yeah. I'm always interested in, how how people were support like how were you supporting yourself while you were playing music did you work odd jobs or were you already like signed to a label were you no. money just playing music at that point no um <laughs> i was okay well this was the other thing i never looked at music as something i never said i'm gonna make it as a rock star like that's unrealistic and dumb that's why I went to school. That's why I pursued writing so hard. That's why I always had these things that were a, like the fact that music actually got to any of the the nice point it has now was not in was not something I ever relied on because that's that's everyone wants to do that. It's so easy and fun. You're in Arrested Development forever, and people you know, just let you get away with total bullshit and you work for two hours a night or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you tour all the time and that gets exhausting and blah, blah, blah. But it's a very lucky position. So for me, I, I was, um, while I was going through school, I always I always just waitressed it. Waitressed it? Waitressed <laughs> I was a waitress. I worked at a bunch of dive bars where uh, it was really fun, but it was brutal. You know, I'd have to like go in the bathroom and be like, you know, hooker, you can't blow dry your hair in here anymore. You gotta get out. Or like clean the barf off the floor when the old veteran barfed and work at places like that. That would have punk shows later in the day, but in, in, the, in the afternoon it was the, um, the longshoremen and hooker crowd, mm -hmm. which I quite enjoyed, except for the puking and stuff. So I always waitressed or worked at bars or did that, and then I'd go on a tour and I'd quit, and then I'd find another thing and did a bunch of weird stuff like that. But I was also going through school at that time. Um, and then uh, I started to pursue writing more seriously when I started to get paid gigs, and I did an internship at a magazine in Vancouver that was also semi-paid, which taught me a lot, and then that then I started working for Vice and all of these other various publications and, and I was also touring a lot at that time and I think the job I was working at, our boss, while I was on tour, had sold, it was a weird coffee shop for all these artists and musicians that were now all in AA so all they did was drink coffee all day. So it was great because it was right in this hip neighborhood and they would tip you like it was a bar. So I'd make them coffee and just talk to them and it would yeah. be like $2 every coffee, which is unheard of. 
because it was all just the same kind of crowd. And while I was working there, my boss uh, sold the place and so I had no job to come back to. But that time freelance, I was making so much money and I was touring a lot and I just kind of decided to pursue those two things and not rely on a bullshit job that I didn't really care about. Yeah, I was kind of wondering, um, I didn't realize that you worked for Vice for that long. So that long. long ago. So, cause long, way like, long before anyone gave a shit about our band. Which yeah, is the funny was, thing because everyone's always like, oh, you just get these writing jobs. No, yeah. I've been doing that way longer in hustling. Mm -hmm. Way fucking longer. You and know? you were already, you were like making money doing that. Yeah. And that. Yeah, like, yeah. Okay. And then I had a bunch of weird, like, you know, I did a lot of um, local stuff and um, I would do, uh, the best stuff is like, you know, doing copy for Red Bull and things like, or Nasty Gal, I would do a lot of that stuff, which was good because it's, you know, brand stuff. Do you think writing for Vice helped, like, when your band started getting bigger or exposure? Like, did anyone care? Uh, that you I think it was just a weird, no, I think it was more a problem because once the band started to get bigger, it was like this weird conflict of interest because I was doing a lot of music writing at that time too. Mm -hmm. So whenever they would want to, the, a band or a place that I, and I had written for so many of the big publications, I was writing for all these like New York spots and, so they'd have to do this disclaimer like, oh, Miss was also published with us. Because you know people think that's cheating. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, you're fucking cheating. You know, no, I'm not cheating. Like, yeah, I'm just a little smarter than you. But, you know, so I already had all these relationships. But, but yeah, so it kind of was happening at a similar time. So then I got really self-conscious of that. And I was like, okay, I'm not, not going to do music writing anymore unless it's special for someone who really wants me to do it. Because it did... It, it felt too close to home. It felt like a conflict of interest when the band really started to be the primary focus of my life. Mm -hmm. And I got too busy to do too much writing. And can you talk about that time period when the band started to become the main focus? Was that when you recorded your first album? No. Okay, so when we made this album called Sorry, which is the most Canadian title of all time, <laughs> which we didn't even realize till later. Oh, it wasn't on purpose? No. <laughs> we... Why it's our drummer always names the titles. She'll normally now she'll read all my lyrics and she'll decide something. But at the time we we could only come up with ten songs. She was like, "Sorry, that's all we have. Sorry," and so we just decided to call it "Sorry." It's like this kind of joke. But then later I was like, "Fuck, that's so Canadian." Yeah. Should have wrote it like Sawi. <laughs> Anyways, um, that was a time I remember we were doing all these crazy punk tours. I had sublet my place. I was working this, this horrible job that I hated. I think I was like living with my boyfriend at the time because I'd sublet my apartment. It just and just with music, I was like, ah, I, no, I'm gonna quit and I'm gonna focus on writing full time. This is ridiculous. And I was saying that to my friend Sasha, who was my editor at Noisy at the time, who's one of my very closest friends. And she remembers me saying this and me being like, ugh, I don't, like, I'm just going to do it for fun. Like, I can't be going on these long tours. Mm -hmm. And then that album, everything kind of changed. And so I had to sort of follow that. And that's when the maneuvering of the two really kicked in. Um, and then, yeah, it became more music-oriented after that with the next album. Because that's when we got publicist a label. We signed with Domino a year and a half later and... You know, Deep Fantasy, which was the first record we did for them, was the one that really made the change. That's yeah, I husband. read, um, I didn't know this, but that was one of the Rolling Stones. Sorry, honey. Oh. Hello. Hi. That's Hello. my husband. Is it eight? Maybe he's home early. Oh, okay. Don't worry. Okay. You can cut that out. He's not no, going to cry. No, we'll leave it. <laughs> he didn't come sit on my lap. <laughs> Okay, the red, you read in Rolling Stone thing? Oh, that Deep Fantasy was like one of the top 40 punk albums yeah. of all time. It wasn't just that. Very weird. nice yeah. thing of them to do. Yeah. They didn't, um, yeah, that was, that was nice. I and what kind it. of, like, what was your Rolling Stone's always been nice schedule twice. like? And Deep Fantasy was a big tour schedule. Um, we That's when we, you know, we went to Japan, we did Australia and New Zealand, we went to Europe tw twice. Went to England a lot. We did a lot of them. I was constantly on tour. Mm -hmm. 
And before that, we had done a lot of touring, but it wasn't the same kind of touring. There was no hotels in touring before. It was like slumming it on people's floors and $3 a day diet. And that's when it changed because we were getting paid properly. We were, there was a little bit more of an interest. And it's just that little slow grow. But for me, I know that the way the industry works now, I think I will remain consistent of where we're at now, which is comfortable. Um, but you know, I'm also, I have other things I'd like to do with my life, like have a family and things like that. And still figuring out how those things can coincide with this way of living. Yeah. Cause it gets a bit like, I don't, you know, with touring, you do it, and once you've kind of seen it, you've seen it. Yeah. And it's great, but yeah, it's a weird thing. Um, but that was, yeah, that was fun when we like first started doing all that. It was awesome. Yeah. And then it gets kind of old. I mean, touring sounds. It doesn't get old. It's more, it's a young man's game. And also, I mean, I don't want to share a, a hotel room with Kenny, I want to share a hotel room with my husband. Yeah. You know, and that's the other thing too. It's once you, and I've been away so much and I like my home, I want to be here. And so having to leave all the time gets a little, I think I have like little stress panic attacks every time. But then I have to remind myself that I'm very lucky to do the two things I like to do for a living. So, but that's kind of what it is now. I feel like we're all little entrepreneurs and just do it our own way and figure it out, right? We're not all stuck to, we're all gonna be fucked when we're 80. <laughs> We're going to be fucked up because in Canada we have like RSPs and things like that. And I was trying to look because I had to start my whole financial career again in America. Like I, you start your credit from scratch, everything when you immigrate. Um, and now I've been obsessed with trying to figure out pensions and all this stuff. Yeah. My husband's very lives like, oh, what if I die tomorrow? And I live more like, what are we going to do when we're 80? You know, so it's a good balance. It's a good mix. It is yeah. a good balance, yeah. That's no, I'm, I'm very, like, crazy about that kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyways, back to rock. Okay, yeah, yeah no. No, no, <laughs> but I mean, those... I just don't want to skip too far ahead. Yeah, 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 but, go ahead. Um, it sounds like you have a pretty good relationship with your bandmates. Um, yeah. And did that change once you were kind of more in the music business and were signed and were touring a lot, or...? Um, like, did the band dynamics change at all? Well, yeah, big time. Our original bass player we had since the beginning, we kicked her out right before we signed because there was so much tension. She didn't get along with anyone, and she was unhappy whether she wants to admit that or not. Like, Kenny and Anne-Marie and myself were friends, and there was just so much tension with her. And it got to the... I, I toured... I played bass in my friend Louise uh, for my friend Louise on one of her tours. She did a small West Coast tour, and I was like, "Oh, I'll play bass for you. It'll be fun." And I realized that I had more fun touring a week with her and two guys I never knew than with my own band. But not because of two of my bandmates, because of one. Yeah. And I was like, "Look, if we're gonna sign and do all this stuff. Like, I can't write music with this person anymore." And everyone kind of felt the same way. So once we kicked her out, which was painful and brutal, and we had to pay her a lot of money because she decided to take legal action like a comp it's very crazy um but that made everything a lot better because the the band is Anne marie and kenny and myself we write and then we just uh have touring bass players mm -hmm. and we've had like friends fill in and stuff and right now we have an old friend from vancouver doing it but having that writing dynamic change was really uh helped our songwriting um, we also work very separately. Everyone knows their roles. Like this last album, we did it here in LA. It took us a month and a bit, but I didn't see Kenny for th three of the five weeks, you know, cause I was, we were doing stuff on our own. We trust one another and it's a very weird process, but it works for us. So that changed a lot of stuff. And then it became as much as it is a dysfunctional family, a business relationship, because you know, okay, we got to do this, 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 and this. A weird thing being yeah. in a band and do you feel like it's very important to be i don't really know how much of the music industry and music business exists anymore um but how involved are you in it in like the financial yeah. aspect or kenny handles most of our finances i mean well, okay so we've had uh, we were always the band that didn't have a manager and refused we tried one for a bit it didn't work for us because we've done everything on our own all you need now is a really good publicist 
and a really good booking agent. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, and it's great to have label support. Domino is, they've been so amazing and supportive to us considering we are, you know, that we're in this catalog of all these great, huge people, but um, that's what's important. Everyone will tell you something different. It's all how you want it to work for you. I've had, you know, so many friends who have managed their whole careers without management. Mm -hmm. And then there's other people that say you have to have it and things like that. But I'm, Kenny's, is, I'm pretty involved, but I'm not as much on the, Kenny's more organized and mathematical than I am. So yeah. he handles a lot of that stuff. Um, and I do have, I have a couple questions about you as like a performer and mm -hmm. a, a lyricist. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, some of the descriptors that I read in album and live reviews, uh, you know, it says you're uh, a front woman, feminist, uh, you know, confrontational, mm -hmm. powerful stage presence. I, I read yeah. those descriptors a lot. And I'm wondering, um, when you're on stage, are you performing or is that yourself is it like part persona um yeah i think i it's a very small fraction of who i am just it's a small fraction of me that's very intense that can only really work in that kind of space or mm -hmm. else no one would want to be around me yeah. so it's all i mean i get very frustrated, I have a temper, I am uh, can get very intense and emotional, and I try and subdue those things in my everyday life because it's not fair to the people around you to act like a complete maniac all the time. And as I get older, those things subdue, but that's, um, yeah, I feel like my state, the time on stage, which I value very much and love because this is one time where I can actually express those things and instead of people going, uh, you're crazy. They're like, more, more. We love it. Please spit on me again. You know, so um, I value that. And I mean, it's like it's changed a lot. I mean, I used to drink tons before I'd play and be on drugs and be jumping around and flying around. And I don't really do that so much anymore, but I still feel like it's intense. And yeah, it's, it's, it's the most intense. It's me being the most intense I can. Okay. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, and then, well, I also read that with your last album, you moved, you're married now, um, you're pretty happy living like a relatively domestic, mm -hmm. quiet life. Um, yeah. And I was wondering how you approach writing your song lyrics now, or has it changed at all? Um, yeah. It seems like the subject matter has changed. It has in a way, and... I steal this quote from my friend Melissa Broder because it's so smart, but she always talks about how, she's a writer um, but she, and a poet, but she always talks about how each writer kind of has the same five themes or the same three themes that they'll explore their entire lives. And they'll just revisit those themes over and over again in different ways, and I don't think I'm any different. I kind of hover around the same couple ideas, but it just comes from a different perspective. I think this last album was a little more self or a little less selfish and poor me and all that kind of stuff and complaining about my life and and feeling hopeless and sad there was a lot m uh, more contentment to it and I also wanted to sing from perspectives that weren't my own and just kind of imagining myself as in, in this other situation and how I would write about that and fiction was really freeing in that way um, because I could say things that I couldn't say as myself. Because everyone assumes lyrics are autobiographical, but a lot of times, of course, they're not. You also you don't want to reveal everything about yourself. You know, yeah. you need to save some things. And for me, because I care so much about lyrics, I think about that person that actually does. I'm sure 99% of the people don't. They just care about moshing around or whatever. But you know, and I'll get like messages or emails from people who will talk to me about that stuff, and it feels good. But lyrics are always very important to me. And so, yeah, they've changed in that last album for sure. It's a reflection of what's changed in my life. Yeah. Just not angry, too. I'm still angry, but I'm not, not about my own stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I read an interview that you did with 
Annie Clark St. Vincent. Mm -hmm. I think you posted on your website. I think. Yeah, that was our, instead of doing a regular flowery bio, which are boring, and I've had to write 9 million of them for my friends, I was like, why don't we just get someone to interview us about the record, and that will be the bio. And I was like, oh, Annie would be perfect, because she can geek out about guitar stuff with Kenny, and she's a fan of the band, and yeah. obviously she's said yes, that's why it exists, but yeah. But I loved when you were talking about uh, how your latest album, um, Paradise, you wanted it to be accessible, and yeah. you approached it in like a totally different way, and just how that always seems to um, rub, you know, punk fans the the wrong way because you are still described as mm -hmm. a punk band, mm -hmm. um, and just yeah, like your just any of your thoughts or feelings about well, punk music. Do you kind of like resent being categorized as punk be as punk because being punk implies that yeah, kind of in this weird way because we never walked around calling ourselves that. Also, as I said earlier, when I was talking about Vancouver, those were the places that were welcoming for us to play. So we were punk, not b b th those were our friends. That was where we could play. We weren't like we're you know I'm not some fucking hardcore crusty who's gonna get mad if you're wearing labels and don't wash yourself with hemp or whatever fucking bullshit veganism and all that. That's not, the punk protocol of that total far end was never something that we were about. And I think we just got, punks are the most stuck up about rules. They are the most stuck up about rules. For all their like no rules, they're very into the rules. You can disappoint them very fast. And no one in my band has ever cared about that and has always just, been excited about the music, playing it, listening to it. We like what we like. You know, who cares? Yeah. Isn't that supposed to be the bad to a punk? Who cares? And yeah, so I do have like a little bit of resentment for that, but I also don't, I think that anyone that would have been mad about the last record's change is kind of an imbecile. And also, if you don't like it, there's all the other albums. We didn't delete them. You don't make a new album and the old one deletes and you can never hear it again. Go listen to that stuff. You don't have to like the new one. That's fine. I need to move on now. Yeah. I'm bored. I don't care if you are bored. There, again, it's right there. Do you think part of, the, of your band being categorized as punk is that your kind of an outspoken, like, aggressive yeah. front person. And it's loud. It's yeah. it's pop music at the speed of hardcore. That's what it is. Mm -hmm. If you slowed, listening to any of our records at 33, it sounds like a dude singing kind of, well, still pretty fast from rock songs. You know, and the, the, it's very melodic. It's very uh, um, hook-driven. It's, that's, that's all there in the core, and... It's just shielded with all Kenny's weird guitar pedals mm -hmm. and the, the, and it's the performance too. The the performance is fast and short and aggressive, which is a you know that that's more of a punk performance than anything else. Mm -hmm. But again, it's because of the scene we grew up in. It's it's when someone calls you a label, you know, everyone calling me like a feminist punk, I mean, I'm a feminist, but a lot of people don't agree with my brand of feminism, and that's what, uh, you know, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so it's just, I understand the necessity of labels, and I don't get mad at them at all, because I think, you know, they make life easier, I guess, in some ways. You can't get mad about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's kind of pointless. Um, well, I actually wanted to, I don't know what I wanted to ask you about your brand of feminism, but I, I just have, like, ask her about feminism. Because <laughs> I read a lot, you, um, you refer to Camille Pagli a lot. Who, she's my favorite. Yeah, I don't think, or where I'm from anyway. Um, you don't like her? She's not one of the favorites Everyone hates anymore. her, she's my favorite. Yeah, I think, like, her, her brand is not necessarily popular, but I really like how you talk about um, like kind of the blanket PC-ness that doesn't allow for um, conversations about Yeah, because you can't subjects. say it that's, that's offensive or you can't question. I'm, I'm, I, I miss the time when you could ask questions without getting in trouble, when curiosity wasn't 
offending someone and stuff like that. But with feminism, I think that, I mean, this is what I was saying. This is what I studied. I spent a lot of, I was studying it when my grandmother was telling me. My grandmother, who was like a very successful female lawyer who goes, ah, that stuff's stupid. Why are you taking that? Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like it was, you know, and now I feel like, um, I think there, there's a lot of people that d don't fully get it and are very, um, there's just a lot of man hatred in it right now that's unnecessary that really makes me bummed out. Um, I thought that the goal was, I mean, I don't think equality is uh, something that's ever going to fully happen. We wouldn't want a utopia, we'd be bored. Um, but I think that there's, again, it's like taking identity politics so far that you can't even discuss anything with anyone else or, or talk to anyone else. And I think there's a younger generation that's gotten all their information about feminism from Tumblr or Twitter or memes instead of actually reading something and, and to, or reading. Also, when did reading something that you don't agree with become a no-no? Like you're supposed to read stuff, like try and figure out new stuff and compare and contrast and discuss it and talk about it. I mean, that's what I loved about doing feminist philosophy. We'd sit there and debate things over and over again. And I feel like that has been lost because it's just shut down with this, this cold social media fist. That's like, if you continue this, and also this is, has to do with the fact that every argument that happens now is through the, the vein or um, what would you call it? Like the screen of, social media so all these arguments are documented whether it's three teenagers fighting in wherever the hell three different places or or public figures fighting about this there's no i just feel like there's a lot of policing now and a lot of it is necessary and there there is a lot of necessary um self-policing that should happen with certain things but with other things no and i just think there's a lot of young feminists who have missed the point because they've They've been fed bad information by bad, not bad role models, but ones that are pushing a narrative that is not good for everyone. It's just good for, but that's, that's the, under, the underlying problem with identity politics again, is that you always going to want what's best for you. And so it takes, you know, there's just so many complicated things with all that. And as you get older, you just start to calm down less. Be like I'm just gonna take every person as they are and try and talk to everyone and be polite and be cool and not be a spaz but yeah it's just I, I don't know there's certain things that I see or or call some feminism being used as this cool new pawn and and you know I'm sorry like it's just it's just it's like with anything with fashion punk becomes cool it's put into fashion recycled regurgitated out Blah, Kim Kardashian wears a discharge jacket, blah, comes back. You know, it's it's like with anything. This is the cycle. You know, civilization, civilizations fall, they'll come back. It's just the cycle. Yeah. It's You just get more apathetic as you get accustomed to it, I guess. You're like, Ugh. Older it's, hard. More apathetic. it's just hard to get mad. Yeah. It's the world. But, you know. Um, I do want to go back to something that totally isn't going to make sense after we That's just okay. I'm trying to like figure out a way to make it make sense, but it doesn't really. It's mm -hmm. going to be an, an abrupt transition. Well, I always <laughs> like those. Okay. <laughs> then you just do a cut and you put like a weird emoji. No, I'll just leave it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Um, also, will you take that salmon out, please? The salmon out? Because I'm going to make those little things for us. Sorry. It's in the brown bag. <laughs> I was like, what salmon? <laughs> yeah. I'm making these little like phyllo pastry spinach salmon things that are okay. delicious. This is Austin. Hi, Austin. Hello. Hello. Nice That's to meet good. you. Nice to meet you. He's going to go to the garage till we're done. It's not too much longer. <laughs> I promise. That's his place. He likes it in there. It's fine. <laughs> um, I did want to ask you about, when I was talking about your feminism and you, your persona as a, a front a front person of your band. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a video of you during a performance kicking a guy out of your concert yeah. for calling you a cunt and yeah. you did it all while continuing to sing. Yeah. And I'm one That's I, called being on a lot of tequila and drugs. Oh that's it. Okay. <laughs> it's horrible. Like, wow, we had we arrived at like midnight. It was a we were playing with power trip. It was a long thing. To be honest, I thought that guy was going like this to me and yelling cunt 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 at me. 
And apparently he w later, his friend had sent me some messages or tried to get in touch with me on Twitter saying, I think you misunderstood. He wasn't trying to yell at you, to which I felt really bad, but who knows what was true. Yeah. Um, that was rare. And I hate that that was caught on video because at that same time we'd gotten arrested in North Carolina. So there was all this stuff going on and then that happened. And I was like, oh, get it away. Um, and then my, <laughs> my husband, who's not very internet savvy, was trying to pause the YouTube video to figure out who the guy was, to find one of his friends in New York to beat him up. I was like, I don't think that's how it's going to work, but okay. Um, yeah, that was dumb. Uh, yeah, but I, I just went off and it was probably unfair. Who knows if he was really being rude. I can't remember. That was a really long year. Oh, okay. <laughs> really. Well, if it never but, happened, yeah. then... It did happen. I did punch him multiple times and yeah, rip yeah. his necklace and pull off his shirt. And uh, all that happened and kicked him out. But his friend tried to say to me later that he... I think I misunderstood him. But yeah. I... It's hard to misunderstand this. But he also could have been really excited because it was a power trip show. I was just hanging by a very thin little thread. Yeah. And he just basically went Whoo! Yeah. And it Phew! I went bananas. So that wasn't fair. Okay. But yeah, but um, I, I rarely have had bad instances. Our crowds are always awesome and really supportive. And if they're being aggressive, it's because I've antagonized it, like spitting water or jumping in the crowd. Everyone's ever always just there to have fun. In Australia, we had one thing where someone was yelling, and I think I like asked the guy if he wanted to come up and do my job for me. But that was more like a teacher be or a mom being mm -hmm. shitty to a kid, which is how I would prefer to do it. Yeah. But um. But yeah, it's always been really good. That was just one of those weird incidences that got caught and got put out and then just became a Googleable thing when you first put my name in, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I was just wondering if you, um, if you had experienced other instances like that or like sexism on the We road. have, and this is another thing that not a lot of people agree with, I really, we, We've grown up playing, we grew up playing in, with hardcore bands, so it's mostly guys. And they've been nothing but supportive and positive and, and nice to us. And we've also never let that be an issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, sure, certain stuff has happened. Of course, things have happened. But that's life. Shitty stuff happens sometimes. I don't consider uh, myself a victim because I have vagina. I'm not in the special vagina Olympics, you know? I don't like to look at things that way. Um, and I, like, I think that you know that whole that whole thing i was speaking on this panel for um school of doodle which is a a girl um a, 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 an online school that's meant to promote confidence in young women through like art and music and stuff like that same as rock camp i i used to teach at the rock camp in vancouver and I was on this panel and, and everyone I was with, who was all girls I know, were all friends in bands. I think they're all great and respect them all very much. But they were, we got on this topic because of someone's question. They all just started talking about like, and this guy's gonna be mean to you. And then and talking about all these negative experiences with men in the music industry. And I was like, yes, okay, that's true. But for those rare instances, Think about the other, all the other guys that were really supportive of you, that were nice, that encouraged you, that protected you in a shitty situation, that had your back when maybe, you know, you needed it. I mean, I don't want to spout this idea. That's my problem with modern feminism. I think there's just, it's a zero sum game. If we win, then you lose. And it's that kind of thing. And I hate it. It's so juvenile. What are we in the Bernstein Bears? No boys allowed. Give me a break. Like it's, no, that's not any way to get anywhere. So anyways, that's a little off, no, but that's my, but that's my biggest there. problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's my, my only problem is that kind of stuff and just not being very realistic about those things. It's not fair. It's um, stupid. Okay. Well, all right. Well then the last few questions, um, kind of deal with the category of women in rock, like this project. Yeah. Um, but just what are your thoughts on the visibility of women in rock history in general? Mm. Is there a, a gender discrepancy? Um, is it not really an issue or is it like better or worse now than it was? Well, I can only speak from the time I've been involved. Um, I can obviously look at the past and romanticize or criticize. Um, 
I just I just remember watching an interview with um, what's her name from Smashing Pumpkins, the bass player who later like called up that radio show and was talking about Darcy. one of the monkeys, Darcy. Yes, and she like released her horses yeah. into the public. She did a lot of cool public scandals after she was done with that band. But there's a video of her in the '90s spouting the same thing like girls have been playing music forever why are we still trying to make it thing and as much as i agree with that and i've said that same thing many times i think that's this great contradiction where we have you know haven't had the same place in music but we've still had a pretty good place and we've still always um we've still been maybe not involved in um the behind the scenes side as much as we are now but we're very involved in the entertainment side or the, the front side and there's been a lot of progression and changes. But I said, but I, but, but that's all what you see. I mean, if you look underground, it's just like that record I was just telling you about, about those women who no one knows who these girls are, but they were, they were big singers back in, in the twenties and they just weren't very well documented. So it all has to do with documentation. That's why it's important that you're doing something like this because you're documenting. Um, because later generations aren't going to know unless it was talked about. And the bad thing now is that there's going to be so much information out there. It's a, a game of pick and choose. But I, I have a contradiction with, with this because I, when I was young, it really meant a lot to me to see, as I said before, when I listened to bands that were mostly boys or, or watch male performers, it was, there was that sexual energy and that excitement and I'd swoon and you know that like cocky magnetism that I love about rock so much but then when I watched girls do it there was that identity and that was special so and that's just me personally there's a lot of people that are girls and watch boys and feel the identity connection and you know that's just the way I saw it mm -hmm. um, so I have a weird contradiction with of not being sure if I want to put all this emphasis on being a woman yet I know for me it's really important and that's such a big part of my identity as a musician that I am female mm -hmm. so I see where I'm kind of contradicting myself but it's confusing yeah and I um, mean well, you can say both into the the I've asked most people about what they think about the category like this being called the women of rock or a yeah. mystery project um you know, and I'm always funny, thinking though. about it. Is it, um, is it more harmful than helpful? Like, is it no. necessary or is it not necessary? It's it's necessary. It's I mean, it's fine. It's you're trying. What's the common ground? They're all girls and they play music and they were all kind of influenced by each other because they were girls. Okay, that makes sense. You're just performing logically. You're, you're making logical connections that anyone else would. I don't think it's offensive or 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 unnecessary um, because you do have a different story. Yeah, you know? like, I actually wanted to go back and ask you. Um, I so you brought up that you're married now and you'd like to have kids, and you know having to think about being a working musician and touring and like having a family and maintaining a marriage i've asked questions like that before and i um i get very different responses because i understand that it's a very gendered question like would i ask a guy that who's in a band but it but it's different for a woman because we have to carry the fetus for nine months we inevitably do spend more bonding time just because of breastfeeding and physical things like that so I can understand why, and then there's still these, these assumptions that the woman would stay with the baby to a certain point. You know, like it's just it's that's still the the norm. Yeah. So I get it. It's that's it's fine I mean, I to think ask. It's gendered, that. but I don't think that it makes it not an important. Yeah, of course, of course, <laughs> so. of course. For me, I think once I begin to have children, I would just all this would take a backseat. I want to be super. Um, Involved. Like my friend Julie who's in Deep Valley, she just had a baby and she brings the baby on tour and stuff and her husband's awesome and supportive, but I'm like, Jesus, how do you do that? But then the baby's got, I mean, my other friend went on tour, she was touring in Germany until she was seven months, like, 
got the last plane home before she would have, you know, like it was not okay anymore. So there's ways of doing it. I just, for me, I think I would kind of take a break. But then, you know, I talk to other people who have done that and they're like, well, it's hard to get back. But there's that same argument when you're a kid and you quit high school and you're like, I'm gonna take a few years off and all the adults go, you'll never get back into the groove of going to university. You have to stay in school. You have to, there's always someone's gonna tell you how you should do it or what's the best way. You just have to do, figure it out on your own and it'll be fine. Discuss it with the person who's helping you with the child. <laughs> Um, I mean, I went kind of backwards. Usually I that's ask like, the, the general women in rock question last, and then that's nice. And yeah. Then we like talked about babies last, so. Yeah, whoops. <laughs> um, was there anything that I left out that you wish I had asked that you want to talk about? No, I don't think so. Um, no. I mean, if not, it's fine. No, I think, I think we're this good. Was great. It's yeah. hard because then once you lose your train, like I can think back that there was something I wanted to say, but now it's gone. So. Yeah, I mean, I think I got everything. Yeah, I you asked lots. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. We did it.